Hey folks, I've recently started reading a book called The Wilder Shores of Marx, Journeys in a Vanishing World, and it's by Theodore Dalrymple. One of the things that's really struck me already, and I'm only in the second chapter, is the really significant role of humiliation in totalitarian regimes. Now, naturally, I would never dream of comparing our present situation in the West to anything that our poor Eastern European cousins had to endure behind the Iron Curtain. That would obviously be a terribly crude and vulgar thing to do. Nevertheless, I think it speaks extremely well of the general mood across the West at present, with regards to mass immigration, major cultural and demographic shifts, very vicious anti-white hate propaganda, and what must now be at least two decades worth of nail bombs, acid attacks, Kalashnikovs and no-go zones. And there's no hint that any of this will be ending any time soon. In fact, we now grapple with the very serious question of, will we someday become an Islamic caliphate? Imagine having to even ask that, and then realise that you're frightened to even mention it, because the social implications are so grave. So I'll read this short paragraph to you, and then try to explain why I think it's relevant to nationalists. He writes, the most sombre reflection I had is that concerning the nature of the power that can command thousands of citizens to take part in a huge and deceitful performance, not once, but day after day, without any of the performers ever indicating, by even the faintest sign, that he is aware of its deceitfulness, though it is impossible that he should not be aware of it. One might also ascribe a macabre and sadistic sense of humour to the power insofar as the performance it commands bears the maximum dissimilarity to the real experience and conditions of life of the performers. It is as if the director of a leper colony commanded the enactment of a beauty contest, something one might expect to see in, say, a psychologically depraved surrealist film. But this is no joke, and the humiliation it visits upon the people who take part in it, far from being a drawback, is an essential benefit to the power for slaves who must participate in their own enslavement by signalling to others the happiness of their condition, are so humiliated that they are unlikely to rebel. He says, Apart from the massacres, deaths and famines for which communism was responsible, the worst thing about the system was the official lying. That is to say, the lying in which everyone was forced to take part, by repetition, assent or failure to contradict. I came to the conclusion that the purpose of propaganda in communist countries was not to persuade, much less to inform, but to humiliate and emasculate. In this sense, the less true it was, the less it corresponded in any way to reality, the better. The more it contradicted the experience of the person to whom it was directed, the more docile, self-despising for their failure to protest, and impotent they became. I have come to see over the years that we have no cause for complacency in the former West, where in the intervening years there has been a growth of official and commercial lying, of not a dissimilar, though less gross, kind. You do not protest because you just want to get on with your life, though you despise yourself a little bit for meekly putting up with it. In any case, you know that the organisation that lies is bigger than you, so protest would be pointless, as well as time-consuming. An atmosphere of fear now pervades most organisations of any size or complexity, thanks largely to regulations supposedly to protect people from such unpleasantness as bullying or discrimination. People watch their tongue, trust no one, cannot joke, look over their shoulder to see who is present, fear to put anything in writing, etc. It all reminds me in a mild way of life on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Therefore I hope this book will serve not only as a historical record, but as something of a warning. Now this was written back in 2012. What strikes me here is that we very possibly underestimate the role of humiliation as a very potent form of political tyranny. When I look at the growing despondency of the West, I can't help but be reminded of the lines from Ovid when he said that dripping water hollows stone. I wonder to what extent the countless indignities and injustices against our culture have contributed to this existential malaise. The perpetual assault disrespect, injury, and reproach of anything that once resembled honour and nobility in our culture. I recently saw an article in the New York Times called the 1619 Project. The article itself specifies the date as the country's original sin. Despite this, it claims that this year is the country's true founding, 
and that Americans ought, instead of heralding the Founding Fathers, to consider moving the founding date of America to the year 1619, the year that slavery began, 400 years ago. In other words, Americans are being beseeched upon to make what is possibly their darkest hour of history, a history every nation shares, their new founding essence, the sum of their very origin and founding character. We all know that the New York Times is an absolute cesspit of a publication, and that the redrafting of history into a less than flattering canonization of evil white people is commonplace among today's cultural philistines, but this did prompt me to wonder how many years of this sort of noxious rancour and spite, this utterly vindictive and malicious resentment and vengeful campaign to mortify our history as anything less than all Dante's nine circles of hell. It really is a crusade of just pure loathing that's almost tantamount to bullying. And I cringe to say bullying because nobody likes a sissy pants, but I mean, look at this. The ideological dimension of social justice or progressivism and its bizarre alliance with Islamism is based in a complex strategy of dehumanization, which undoubtedly has major effects on the health of a nation's psyche. Perhaps when we are finally kind enough to ourselves to recognise that the present chaos of our circumstances is symptomatic of a very authentic and concentrated campaign of Soviet-style terror, a demonstrable crusade against our people, whose genetics are looked on distastefully as something toxic and rancid. I think it's worth remembering this word, humiliation. I think it was Douglas Murray who said that you can tell the difference between a critic who is a critic because they want to see you get better, they want to see you improve, and that of a propagandist who wishes to see you fail. In other words, an enemy. Truthfully speaking, to what extent is today's critique of the West an endeavour to see us flourish? The relentless indignities bestowed upon our culture, the forced cohabitation with hostile religions, the joyful pursuit in our demographic replacement, the mass molestation of our children as a regrettable but necessary collateral damage in the quest for multiculturalism. And for those who consider this hyperbolic, I need only point you to the psyche surrounding the Muslim grooming gangs. How is it that for 40 odd years an entire nation, including our politicians, were petrified into a state of catatonic docility when thousands and thousands and thousands of foreign men were cruising the streets, looking for our children to molest. And molest they did. Oftentimes we roll our eyes and ask, how could the police have been so incompetent, and why were those who were involved not doing their jobs? But that even the police found themselves so nervous about even approaching the subject with their superiors speaks of something a good deal more sinister, and something that I think is worth interrogating. This isn't a normal, rational, or commensurate state of affairs. It speaks of something a good deal more malevolent and perverse. For so many people, in so many positions of power to have got it so grotesquely wrong, this isn't a case of simple negligence or even fraudulence. Although I'm confident that that played its own role. This is something far more pernicious. It's a psyche that plays testament to a kind of societal-wide dread. And it's owing to this terror they've bestowed on the public that these violent criminals have been able to live without fear of reprisal. This is testament to the campaign of fear orchestrated by the left and professional full-time race hustlers whose grasp on power actually holds sway over our chief police constables. Even when a full-scale rape epidemic is right under their nose. Imagine a criminal investigation where facts are observed and admitted but it is commanded by a political substratum that these facts must not be allowed to have any meaning or implications. That's how insidious this terror campaign has become. This far exceeds normal editorial spin. In fact, we ought to begin to see this as a kind of Bolshevik campaign of psychological terror. How can it be that nations with such a rich and beautiful culture can find themselves simultaneously so morally confused and so anxious and unsure about their own identity? And the reason I share this story isn't to be sensational, but that this kind of existential feebleness and lassitude, this societal lethargy, is precisely what Hannah Arendt describes in her book The Origins of Totalitarianism. She writes that Pavlov's dog, 
the human specimen reduced to the most elementary reactions, the bundle of reactions that can always be liquidated and replaced by other bundles of reactions, that behave in exactly the same way. This is the model citizen of a totalitarian state. To what extent does Western kind resemble the listless stupor of Pavlov's dog? And I don't say this to depress or blackpill anybody. I actually think it can be a positive, because the more cognizant and discerning we are about the mechanism of demoralization, back to Ovid's dripping water, hollowing stone, the more conscientious we can be to intervene, to gradually restore that confidence and self-assertion that has rotted away. A little bit like cognitive behavioural therapy, one ought to observe when this is happening, when those whistles are made from the media and the anti-white cabal, who expect you to come slavering like Pavlov's dog, you can start to intervene with that automatic behaviour and curtail it. I'll finish by giving you one of my favourite passages from a Kafka short story, it's called In the Penal Colony. I've always liked it because it's terribly dark and quite spooky. The soldier held a heavy chain to which were connected the small chains which bound the condemned man by his feet and wrist bones, as well as by his neck. The condemned man looked so like a submissive dog that one might have thought he could be left to run free on the surrounding hills and would only need to be whistled for when the execution was due to begin, and he would come bounding back. What's the moral here? Having been treated like a dog, it comes as no surprise that he has become dog-like. Perhaps that's something, as Westerners, we really ought to think about 